Y'all planning for this? Welcome back, TPR Nation. This is Jamie Shalansky in an episode of Worlds to Conquer. And today I want to talk about the prospects who don't hire you, the prospects who don't want to work with you, the ones that are the do it yourself category. And I want to start by first telling you how we at Shalansky and Associates, our RIA up in Anchorage, Alaska, started charging for prospect appointments. So Floyd and Rosa Shalansky, Mike and I's mom and dad, started the company back in 1981. When they started, we had a broker dealer relationship. We only went independent RIA in 2018. So we've seen both sides of the world, the BD space, as well as the independent space, and of course, the hybrid where you have combinations. And as we went through this, when in the 1980s, uh, the biggest rage was doing seminars for people. So my mom and dad met um, Jack Root, who sold successful money management seminars and financial strategies for successful retirement seminars. And they established relationships with the community uh, schools here in Anchorage, Alaska, and throughout uh, different parts of Alaska that were more remote as well. And what's unique about our location, which is true of Alaska, but also true of a lot of rural communities as well, is that you really don't have like, you didn't have like a convention center or a major classroom that everyone could be brought to in order to learn these things. So you did want to partner with schools because schools had auditoriums and schools had libraries. And so we would teach these classes. My dad would probably put on three to four seminars a month, three to four seminars a month. And the significance behind these is that not just the seminar, but the seminars were multiple days. So the seminars were four different sessions. And so it'd be a Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday, then a Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday. And he would run these classes. So he'd work all day long. Then he would uh, go home, take a nap, shower, put on his best suit, and then go teach these classes in the community schools. And by the time that I was about gosh, 12 years old, um, I was working the registration booths in the in the school, checking people in as they came in, and they would go through this long program. And what was beautiful about the seminar is that you have over eight hours, sometimes 12 to 15, establishing a relationship, establishing um, a way that they get to see you as the authority on a particular subject. So you're building credibility with time. And that's one of the reasons we have the highest conversion ratios, because we still do seminars. I mean, fast forward the clock a few decades, we're still doing seminars, though we've gone off of successful money management and financial strategies for successful retirement. We are putting on um, federal benefit classes classes that are an eight hour all day program. Now we only do that one time. So we haven't had a hustle like we did several decades ago, simply because technology has improved our way to be able to communicate with people. But when we establish this credibility with the audience, uh, what we would give is my father created this uh, fact finder. And it was this multiple page document that that unfolded like a portfolio. And it's 11 pages long and asked you all the information about your demographic, your financials, all these different sectors. And if you filled out that fact finder, and you turned it into our office, you could come in and have a one on one consultation, in which my dad would go through the information or give another one of the representatives in our office, the fact finder to go through it with you. And uh, this was a great way. And it was it's is such a beautiful process that we still use the base bone of this process, the backbone of this process today. And we can tell you which clients are probably going to hire us by the amount of information and time that they take going through that financial fact finder and filling it out. We had a coach once tell us when he looked at our fact finder and he said, oh my gosh, you need to slim this down. I would never fill this out. Well, great. You're not our target audience. We don't want you to fill out this information because you're not our target audience of who we're trying to reach. So it was this really unique tool at the time. We've tried to digitize it recently um, with very little success because I think that there's there's a psychological alienation of filling out online forms that doesn't exist when you have something printed down in front of you. Uh, when you have something printed down in front of you and you're having to go through and research information and fill out a form, it's just a different experience than when you're going through and doing type form or gravity forms and you're filling things out online. 
So we found that people felt when they were filling things out online, they would make up information, they would use rounder numbers, or they would feel that they had to put something in a field. So they would just put down something random that didn't help us later when we were doing the financial planning. We're still flushing it out. But for the most part, um, so far, it's not been a tremendous success. We'll see if that improves as we uh, tweak our user experience and the way that people are receiving it. Um, So we would fill out these fact finders and people would come in and they'd have their one-on-one consultation. And for decades, you'd get done with an appointment, you'd have a really good meeting, and then you'd have a brain sucker is what we'd call it, a tire kicker, a vacuum, somebody that came in and just wanted to extract as much knowledge um, from you as possible in the shortest amount of time in which they didn't have to pay for your services. And so these became people that we would just kind of like, you went into a prospect meeting and you were, you were on a seesaw. You're like, okay, is this going to be, am I going to get hired? Is this going to be a good experience? Or am I going to deal with somebody that's just kind of brain sucking and take advantage or, or trying to trip me up? And we problem solved about a decade ago. And we said, man, we're just coming into these meetings with the wrong attitude uh, because we're not sure we are getting done with them and going, oh, that person was a brain sucker. And we would dismiss their fact finder or... Or, you know, we'd have some type of visceral negative reaction to this. And that wasn't fair. When we sat down and we said, hold on a second, people are coming to us because they want information. And for us to get annoyed that we offered this appointment to them and they said yes. And then for us to get annoyed that they weren't going to give us money in exchange for this, that's not fair to that person. That is not an exchange that delivers any type of massive value to either one of us. It doesn't put us in the best mind frame. It doesn't serve the client or prospect at all. So how can we change this? What would it be worth to go into every meeting and be like, wow, I am so glad I did that. That was just wonderful. I showed up at my best. I gave them a lot of great information and I'm not leaving that appointment begrudging the fact that I didn't get hired. And so as we started brainstorming around this, we said, well, what if we charge for prospect appointments? And it was such a scandalous idea at the time uh, that we really kind of kicked it around for a few leadership meetings and said, people aren't going to pay for that. Nobody charges for prospect appointments. And then we kind of applied different logic to it. And we said, nobody pays for prospect appointments. Well, okay, so if I go to a doctor's office and I'm like, hey, I've got a problem with my hip, are they going to charge me for that consultation? Before I go get an ultrasound, before a radiography looks at, a radiology looks at my radiographs, is somebody going to charge me for that appointment? Yes. Am I a prospect at that time? Because I didn't hire the doctor to do any type of surgery on me. Am I a prospect? Yes. And they're charging. Okay, great. So it works in that industry. All right. Well, what about attorneys? If I go in and I ask for an hour of time with the attorney and Am I getting that for free or do I have to pay for it? I have to pay for it. All right. But what if I don't hire that attorney to be my legal representation? I'm just interviewing them. Oh, I still have to pay for it. Okay. It works in that industry too. And so instead of just being so tunnel focused about what people would or wouldn't be willing to do in the financial planning space, we broaden our horizon and we said, this is not true because people are already used to this process. They're just used to it in different professions. So what if we applied it to our own? And what if we charge for these prospect appointments? Would we feel better about going into that meeting, answering a ton of questions, whether or not we got hired and delivering so much value that that client walked or that prospect walked away with a really positive experience? It was like, yeah, yeah, we would. Okay, great. Well, how much should we charge? And this is when the head trash came in, right? And we kicked around quite a few numbers. And at first it was like, you know, maybe $47. Oh my gosh, $50 is a lot of money. I don't know if somebody would pay for it. It was $97. Then it was $197. And then finally today, we charge $497 for a prospect appointment. And if you want to meet with one of the Shalanskis, the fee is substantially higher than that. And the fee is higher to meet with the Shalanskis because we want more people meeting with a lot of the financial advisors that we've onboarded in our office. In our RIA Shalansky and Associates, we are blessed, not because we're lucky, but because we are disciplined 
spend and put into the energy into doing marketing all of the time. And so while you don't hear a lot about Shalansky and Associates, we have a very targeted market that we are trying to reach. Um, sometimes I tell people that you don't hear about the Shalanskys, but until you do, and the first time you do, you never stop hearing about them. And so we really focus on who we're trying to meet in a concierge level and a specific target audience. And because we put our energy into these efforts, we have an abundance of prospects. We have more prospects than we have time on the calendar to see. And that is because one of the reasons is we practice surge. So we don't have 365 days out of the year that we're going to meet with people. We have very dedicated times in which we meet with individuals. And we've got these abundance of prospects coming in hand over fist. We have so much opportunity to create so much impact in the world that we have to hire other financial advisors who are looking to build their book of business. So we actively hire the right type of financial advisor to onboard with our team and become part of this abundance mentality. But in order for a prospect to come in and meet with us, they get charged a fee. And the, and that just applies to everyone across the board. Uh, there are, every financial advisor is allowed to have five exceptions in a year, five, one handful. And so if your top client refers somebody to our firm, then that can be one of your exceptions if you like to, if you choose that person. If you have a family member or relative, that can be one of your exceptions if you care to use it. Uh, but once we get to that sixth person, even if it's another referral from your top client, either that referral person has to pay or you as the financial advisor has to pay. And I'm really staunch on this rule because I cannot empower my team to go collect this fee for these appointments and tell them how much value we're going to deliver and that they have to ask for that check up front for the prospect to make this appointment. And then for you to say that it's not worth it, for you to say the time and energy that they put into these meetings isn't worth the fee. So we charge for the meetings up front. If it's a six exception, then you have to pay for it out of your own pocket. And then let me tell you, that will really diminish how many times you sit with somebody for free in our office. So we do these prospect appointments and because we're charging for them and we know there's a value in that time, we're going in to deliver massive value. And so we start off uh, with doing our prospect process, which is a giant process. Uh, we have a beautiful blueprint. A blueprint is an if this, then that scenario. And so we go through it and it filters through the relationship managers are responsible for booking the prospect. They cultivate that relationship moving up to the uh, meeting. And the first time that the financial advisor is engaging with the prospect is uh, one behind the scenes when they're downloading their personal financial fact finder and they're looking through all the information. And then two, when they go into the meeting and they they have that hour of time to get uh, dedicated to answering your questions. Uh, one of the things that we started doing probably about eight years ago, which was so stupid, simple, we can't believe we missed it for so many years. So for so many years, we would ask for all of this information. I mean, a litany of your financial information. I've done an episode that goes through our personal financial fact finder at a laborious level. So if you're interested in that, go back and listen, and you'll get everything we ask for in our entire process outlined in that podcast episode. If you're not sure which episode it is, email us at lifestyleattheperfectra.com. And one of our team members, our podcast curator, Amber will make sure that you get it. So we go through that entire process and we didn't ask anyone for their questions. Um, so for years, for decades, we would get all this information from you and then we would wait to sit down in that conference room and then ask you, what questions do you have? And so about eight years ago, we said, you know what? Can we ask the people and before the meeting what their questions are so we make sure we're a little bit prepared? <laughs> and it worked. It worked beautifully. I said, hey, what are the burning questions that you have in order to get value out of this meeting? What do you want to make sure that we answer? And we started getting people's questions. Now, sometimes it'll just be one or two quick questions. Um, sometimes there's pages of things in which people have really written out long scenarios and they give us a lot of details and they want the answers to it. And if they were going to ask a long and laborious question, 
on paper before the meeting, were they still going to ask it in the meeting? Yes, 100%. But now we're prepared for what that question is. Now we have an opportunity to collaborate in our office. We all have different areas of specialty and interest and experience. And so we have this really open collaborative team that says, hey, listen, I don't have experience in NUAs. Can somebody else help me here? Have you done this and this before? And so we'll tag other team members in because they are all firm clients. We They're all company clients. And so we all want to make sure that the value is being delivered to them. And so we'd go through that prospect meeting and we'd answer all of their questions. And once we get done answering all of their questions, if we've done a good job, and they've hit our three P's, right? So they're personable. There's got to be somebody that we actually enjoy talking with. We can't have somebody on the calendar whose appointment we dread. That is a terrible experience for both of us. Um, they have to be productive. They've got to listen to information. They've got to listen to advice. They've got to be willing to take advice. So sometimes we call this coachable. Are you coachable? Um, and then they have to be profitable. We as a company have a responsibility to earn money and stay in business. And we cannot do that if we operate on a charity format or if we subsidize our book of business for everyone else. Um, we've got to be really cognizant of that. We have a responsibility to our clients. We have a responsibility to our employees. We have a responsibility to our family and to our community to stay in business. So we're really conscientious of that. Now, here is what charging for prospects really means. So do we close all of the prospects that we meet with? No, we do not. We filter our closing ratios based on one, did we want them as a client? And that is not a, well, they didn't hire me, so I didn't want them as a client kind of question. That's not the way that we're making that decision. The decision is made during that meeting, would we pitch them? Is this somebody we would love to work with? And if the answer is yes during that meeting, we're not going to offer any justifications after that meeting as to why it didn't work or why they weren't a good fit. If they were a good fit in that meeting and we wanted them to hire us, then they count towards our closing statistics. Now, after that, then they've got to decide if they want to hire us. This is one of the reasons that uh, we set a lot of gross income goals. We set a lot of growth goals. We set goals about how much or how many more new clients that we want to bring on. However, we don't ever tie extreme accountability around onboarding new clients. And the reason that is, is because it isn't your decision. So you're tying extreme accountability. You're giving yourself a, I have to get hired by 10 people, but those 10 people have to acquiesce. They have to have a willing participation in this. So a lot of times when you're goal setting, make sure the goals are within your capability. So if I'm looking at my revenue and saying, hey, listen, I want to grow by 10%, that's within my power. I can raise my fees or I can cut my expenses and I'm in control of those. So making sure that your extreme accountability, if you're practicing, that as a tool is tied around something that you can actually achieve independently, not something that is contingent on another person's free will. So when we get through those appointments, and we sit down and we say, okay, would we have had this person hire us if they decided to? Yes. All right. Those go in my closing statistics. All right. Now, what's the reality? How many appointments do we actually close? Now, as Shalanskis, if we get in front of prospects and they hit our three Ps, they're personal, they're productive, they're profitable. We've got a good closing ratio. Our closing ratio is probably 50 to 75%. It's pretty darn high. But most financial advisors are in the 25% or less category. And that's okay, because uh, they're still learning which clients to onboard, which ones to not. And part of the process of why we charge for the appointments is so that remember when I talked about it, like we didn't want to come out of that meeting feeling fatigued that we sat across from a do it yourself individual. And so who is a do it yourself individual? This is the person that has a lot of knowledge on a lot of our areas of expertise. And they've taken the right steps over time to put those building blocks in place. And so when we have a person that is a do it yourself, and they come into our office seeking advice, we're not looking at them going, oh, well, they're so smart, they just figured all this out. We, we don't think that's negative. We're like, amazing. This is fantastic. Good for you. So recently, we had to talk to one of our advisors about this, because they had a really solid prospect on their schedule. 
And it was a married couple and only the husband attended. The wife did not attend. Um, she was on everything as far as joint paperwork and all this kind of stuff, but he was the one that primarily managed the uh, information in the household. So he just wanted to attend. She wasn't really interested in going through the appointment. And so we went through all of the appointment and uh, went through every area of financial planning and answered the gentleman's questions and validated the ways he was doing great. He was doing fantastic. Fantastic. He had taken a lot of advantages. He had already converted a significant amount of money out of his IRA into his Roth. So he was on the right track. He had been doing a lot of investment planning. He had been doing a lot of tax planning. And he did a really good job of establishing a successful retirement um, nest egg. And he was a do-it-yourself kind of guy. And so when we got done with the meeting, he was like, you know, he was, he was a real do-it-yourselfer. But I feel weird about the conversation. And I said, okay, well, kind of t- let's talk about that. And he said, I, d- I didn't know if I had enough value to offer. And I said, well, hold on a second. Just because somebody is a do-it-yourselfer does not mean you didn't provide value to that individual because I wasn't in the meeting, but I'm going to look at all the information and here's what I see. I see a educated, successful individual who has taken deliberate steps to make sure that they are self-funded for their retirement. This is a person who has dedicated time to become educated in areas of finance so that they don't outlive their money. Now, this is also an individual who's probably running 100% of the family finances by themselves. So they are the ones independently making all of these decisions, and therefore they are solely responsible for the retirement of him and his wife. And do you think that is the time in which an educated individual wants to get a second opinion? They want to get a second opinion to make sure that they are doing everything correctly and that there isn't something that's been a glaring mistake. And it was like, wow, I didn't think of it that way. And I said, yeah, think about a lot of us financial advisors. That's the number one reason we don't go hire financial advisors for ourselves is that we look at it and we say, oh, we have all this knowledge. We have all this education. We're going to be able to make all these right decisions by ourselves because this is our area of expertise. But so many financial advisors do not hire financial advisors for themselves. And they end up being the cobbler's kid who goes barefoot. This is so important to me that I sit down with our family and we all on a court quarterly basis and we check mark all the boxes. Did we look at our tax plan? Did we look at our state plan? Did we look at our insurance? Did we do this? Hey, can I bring in a second opinion? Is there anything that I'm not, I'm forgetting? And we get some outside opinions, some outside help to make sure we are making smart choices with our money. And if I sat down with somebody and somebody said to me, oh my gosh, Jamie, you're doing an amazing job. You've thought out everything. Um, I think you're on track here. You're on track here. You might want to make a small change there. But other than that, you're doing really great. I would not look at that appointment and be like, wow, what a waste of money. I can't believe I'm doing everything correct. And he even said at the financial advisor I was talking to, he said, this is kind of like going into the doctor and being upset that they told you you were healthy. And I said, that's exactly what it was like. And if the client wasn't annoyed or upset when they were talking to you, if they ended that meeting and said, wow, thank you so much. This was incredibly valuable to me. Uh, this is exactly what I wanted. Then you checked mark the box of what they were looking for. They were looking for another person to just make sure that they were on track. And you don't get to determine what is valuable to another human being. You get to provide value as you see it but you don't get to decide if it's valuable to another human being. And that is one of the reasons when we work with our financial advisors is that we talk internally a lot about delivering massive value to prospects and clients, but that's jargon. That's financial industry jargon. That's internal language. We don't ever go to a prospect or a client and say, "Um, I want to provide you with value. Was this valuable? Because now you've opened up Pandora's box to them being able to define what is valuable and what is not valuable to them. And that is very subjective. Normally, most people do not have the same relationships around values. So we want to be careful with the language that we use. And so instead of saying my job is to deliver massive value, 
I will say, are there any other burning questions that you had today? I want to make sure I answer those for you. And that allows them to go, no, I came in, you answered this, you answered that, you provided me with this. This has been fantastic. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. So if I'm getting any of that type of closing language, any of that, nope, this is exactly what I needed. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Or when do we meet again? Or how do I go on to work with you? Um, That tells me I've done a really good job and I provided that value. And so I know I delivered massive value in that meeting. So make sure that you're really frameworking that appropriately. And when you do get somebody that's a do-it-yourselfer, don't just dismiss it that you don't have anything to bring or that they are so arrogant that they don't need any type of help. That's oftentimes not the case. We've all had prospects where it is the case. There are always exceptions to that rule. But most of the time, people want to know if they're on track. Money is emotional. This individual, when I'm hearing this story, is bearing the responsibility of 100% of the financial decisions in their house. Household. And that's stressful. And sometimes we want another professional to look at us and say, yes, you're on track or holy crap, you can't do that. You've made an egregious error. We've got to get this fixed now. And That could have happened. This individual could have made a big mistake. They didn't know if they had been making mistakes or not. They think that they're doing everything correctly and they need that validated by a professional who lives, eats, and breathes in this space. That is a value to another person. And that was a great meeting. Whether you charge for your prospect meetings, you lottery them off and people win them, or you always see people for free, you want to provide as much value as possible. And that means creating an environment where you don't get annoyed when you think somebody is a do-it-yourself or a tire kicker or a brain sucker. What do steps do you need to take to eradicate that language from your vocabulary when it comes to offering people financial advice? advice. TPR Nation, everything that we do at The Perfect RAA is about delivering massive value to you so that you can spend more time outside of the office with the people that you love and be highly profitable in the process. And that means that we provide you with actionable advice that you get to take and implement in your practice for your team right now. So as we went through this process today about talking about the do-it-yourselfers that that come into the office, I hope some of the conversation resonated around you. Here are things that you can take as actionable advice. Um, If you're asking me if seminars still work, yes, yes, they work. We've been doing them for decades. People are still eager for financial advice, whether you're doing them online or in person, it still works. People still crave education on finance. Second of all, what is your prospect process? How are you getting the most information? Are you doing something really basic like asking prospects? what questions they have that you can answer in the meeting before the meeting so that you can come into it 100% prepared. And then third, what do you need to do? What steps do you have to take in your practice so that when you are meeting with a do-it-yourselfer, when you are meeting with somebody that's a tire kicker, you're not feeling as annoyed or agitated? What steps do you need to take right now? Is it charging for appointments? Um, Do you want to start rolling that out? Update your ADV, charge for prospect appointments, take the same process we use at Shalansky and Associates and figure out how to apply it to your RIA. So that way, when you meet with somebody, you are so impassioned with delivering them value and answering their questions. You're never, ever annoyed by them coming in. What steps do you need to take so that you are always in the right frame of mind to deliver massive value? TPR Nation, this is Jamie Shalansky in an episode of Worlds to Conquer. Go find people who share your values and change the world. Hold on before we go. Something that you need to know. This isn't tax, legal, or investment advice. That isn't our intent. The information designed to change lives. Financial planning can make you thrive. Start today, don't think twice. Be a better husband, father, mother, and